Hello, everybody. Hello. Oh, I can hear Hello. you. I can hear you on your side. I can hear. Well, you couldn't before. Rhyme. That's weird. Maybe because it went live. Is it playing somewhere else? In like no. a window? Do you have a window open? No. Well, it would. That wouldn't matter anyway. Sorry, you guys are seeing how the sausage gets made, as they say. I have made no sausage. No. Oh, huh. I heard it again. I heard it. It. I think there's too many cooks. Too many cooks. Did too that make many... it go away? Check, check. Nope. No. No. Nope. Right. No. No. Uh, well, I don't know what's causing it then. Can you guys hear it? Are you even listening? Is anybody out there? I know Kristen and Roger are watching. Maybe <laughs> I see Kristen and Roger. And you were there. Romper, and you were there. Stomper. <laughs> um, so you're still hearing yourself? Check. No, mm, that's enough. It's fine. Let's just go with it. I don't know if it's me or not. I can't tell. Well, it can't be me. I have headphones in. Well, I mean, I don't know if it's me or if it's actually just some weirdness in the hangout. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I've okay. got everything but my earphone turned down. I can't imagine the earphone would be doing that. All right. You ready? Sure. All right. Let's get this popsicle stand rolling. That is not a thing that people say, no. just so you guys know. People don't say that. All right. In three, two. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Sword and Laser, episode number 196. I'm Veronica Belmont. And I'm Tom Merritt. Sword and Laser is a book club, but it is so, so much more. We bring you author interviews, news from the world of science fiction and fantasy, and, of course, awesome discussions from fans just like you. And we mean awesome discussions because the fans are awesome because the fans fund the show at patreon.com slash sword and laser. Thank you all to all the folks who back our show. Uh, we go on the value for value model. If you find some value from the show and you can kick us a few bucks, please do so at patreon.com slash sword and laser. So today is our, um, we are going to be discussing uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick. And uh, we are at the mid-month point right now, so we're not going to be doing a wrap-up, but there may be some small spoilers. We're going right. to try to not keep it too spoilery um, because a lot of people haven't finished the book just yet. And we'll still um, have it at the very end of the show in case you want to avoid all spoilers. Right. We'll go through all the news, all the discussion, all the calendar stuff first, and then if you're not quite ready to join in on the book club discussion, maybe save it for next week or for the week after, whenever you feel like finishing the book. Yeah. Meanwhile, uh, one of the characters in Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, maybe this is a spoiler for some of you, but I hope not, uh, drinks scotch. Yes, indeed, which is what we are both drinking today. Tom, what are you drinking? I'm having a 10-year-old Talisker single malt. Are you drinking that from a beaker? No, no, it's just a glass. Oh, for some reason, it looked like a like a science beaker. No, I was like, actually, that, was that would really be kind of cool. cool. Glass, Tom. I yeah. should do that next time. <laughs> That's a great idea for a scotch glass. Yeah. Um, I am drinking a Glenmorangie. Um, I think it is a 12-year. I'm not Ooh. really sure, but Fancy. it's it's pretty good. Yeah, I'm not sure where I bought the bottle from or why, because I don't typically buy scotch. I usually um, drink bourbon uh, if I'm going to be drinking a brown liquor. This was given to me by Shannon Morse. Oh, that's nice for officiating. Yeah. Oh, that I didn't. I get you also. Scotch? You did. You got me a scotch <laughs> as well. That's why I marry people for scotch. <laughs> for the free booze. Yep. <laughs> um, all right. Well, let's kick off the show with our first official section: the quick burns. So we have a post from Dara. Uh, she says that Jonathan Nolan of Interstellar um, is going to be adapting Isamov's uh, Foundation series, uh, the trilogy, in fact, for HBO, which is super exciting. I know, Tom, you're a huge fan of, of the Foundation series. Um, we read uh, Ch Children of Men. Oh, no. We read Foundation, didn't we? We read Foundation, but what's the name of the first book? Isn't there a name of the first book? Yeah, we read that, and Jonathan Nolan is going to be writing it. <laughs> I will say while you look it up very quickly well, to make I, sure. I furiously. Uh, yeah, so Jonathan Nolan, if you don't know, he's Christopher Nolan's brother and wrote Interstellar with Christopher Nolan. Christopher Nolan, of course, directed Interstellar. Christopher Nolan of Inception, The Dark Knight, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jonathan Nolan's also the showrunner on Person of Interest. So it's Jonathan Nolan working with HBO to make Foundation into 
a TV series. Yeah, that's exciting. Gosh, I cannot figure out what I'm trying. I must be thinking of a totally different book. I think I am. Um, I remember reading Foundation and really enjoying it. And of course, uh, I think the well, best- Well, we read book Arthur C. Clarke, who I often group with Isaac yes, Asimov in my head. Uh, Children of Earth, right? Children so. of Earth. Is that it? Is that the name of the book? Children of Earth? Now I think I got that wrong. I don't think that's the name of the book. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, yeah, Childhood's End is the name of that book. Sorry. Childhood's End. Thank you. And the reason I was laughing is because um, Harry Seldon, uh, of course, is the commissioner of the uh, Fantasy <laughs> Sports League, uh, which is a show that Tom and Justin Robert Young do. So if you ever want to go back and binge listen to some very funny sports talk radio with a fantasy bent, a fantasy and sci-fi bent, uh, check out FSL yeah. Tonight. Uh, only only sports in there is in the cliches. The rest is fantasy and sci-fi. Which is frankly hilarious. Uh, Terp Kristen pointed out that the 2014 World Fantasy Award winners were announced, and you can find the list at worldfantasy.org slash awards. Best novel went to A Stranger in Olondria by Sophia Samatar. And Terp Kristen says, I think we should think about reading it sometime soon as a sword pick. Oh. And Saladin Ahmed agrees. Did well, he actually agree... No, he agreed okay, that it's I, a good book and people should read it. He didn't okay. specifically agree it should become a sword pick. He probably would agree. But yeah. he may want us to read his books first. Well, you're going to be needing to pick a sword pick uh, in a week or so here. That's so true. there you go. You got, you've got a nomination. Uh, other true. winners, uh, Andy Duncan and Ellen Clays for Wakula Springs for novella, a short story by Caitlin Kiernan, The Prayer of 90 Cats. George R. R. Martin and Gardner DeZoy's Dangerous Women for Anthology, and Caitlin Kiernan's The Ape's Wife and Other Stories for Collection. I'm still going to say Gardner DeZoy until someone continues, continues to correct me. Um, I heard a lot of people were, were talking about Dangerous Women this week on Twitter, so I think that news was very exciting to a lot of the authors that were part of that series. Um, uh, I believe Robin Hobb was one of them. Um, there were a lot of great authors in that, in that anthology. Um, Maybe, you know, we, we have read anthologies in the past. Maybe that would be another fun collection to do yeah, also. Yeah, definitely. Getting some good ideas from this, uh, from this uh, World Fantasy Award winners list. Thank you, World Fantasy Award winners, for yes. writing books. Sandra has a post uh, saying sci-fi's adaptation of the Magician series has cast Elliot, Penny, and Julia's roles. Um, this is over on uh, Entertainment Weekly's blog. And at first I was like, oh, should we talk about this? Because they're, they're not talking about, you know, any the, the super main character. Um, what's his name? I don't know his Quentin. Name. Quentin. Yeah, they haven't cast Quentin or Alice or Janet. Mm -hmm. But we've uh, got um, Hale but, Appleman is going to play Elliot, uh, who's Quentin's older wine-loving friend, one of my favorite characters in the book. And uh, Arjun Gupta is going to play Penny, uh, the punk student, the cool badass punk student. And Stella Maeve will play Julia, Quentin's crush from his high school days. Um, so yeah, so I, I'm not familiar with these actors, but I, I think I'm going to go check out their IMDb's later to see if they fit in with my mind image of yeah. what these characters are. I'm reading The Magician's Land right now, which is the third book that just came out this summer, uh, and I'm very, very much enjoying it. So I'm excited to see this. That's probably why I was like, what? No, Elliot is very important uh, to later books. But you're uh -oh, right. In the okay. first book, he's not quite as prominent, although he's fairly prominent. You, yeah. You yeah. Uh, scribd is a, uh, a service that does ebooks along with a lot of other things. And they're adding audiobooks to their monthly subscription service. Rob posted this up uh, on the Goodreads for us. Here's the thing. They are now offering more than 30,000 audiobooks, including big name publishing houses. They have a lot of big deals. It's not 30,000 audiobooks you've never heard of. It's all part of their unlimited reading series, which is $9 a month. So it's cheaper mm -hmm. than Amazon Kindle Unlimited. And it has more audiobooks than Kindle Unlimited, which just says it has thousands of audiobooks. Doesn't tell you how many. Yeah, I mean, if you really want the full full collection of stuff for Amazon, you have to kind of be an Audible subscriber too, and that's an extra fifteen bucks a month. And that only on gets you one title a month, whereas Scribd is going right. to give you as many as you can listen to. So I'm I'm curious about this. I mean, 
it, it sounds pretty good. I, I don't know if I'm willing to give up my Audible subscription right now, and I don't know if I really feel like doing both, because um, that's a lot of money a month. For, you know, that's the problem, really right? We read, read so many varied titles that I would, I'm almost guaranteed to not have titles available from Scribd. Mm -hmm. And I have to have the titles we read, right? So I wouldn't want to limit myself that way. So I'm probably going to stick with Audible myself because of that. Uh, but if you're the kind of person who rips through more than one audiobook a month, it might be worth checking out. Absolutely. All right, we have some more uh, casting news today. Deadline uh, is reporting The Expanse has been pretty fleshed out well with people. This is from Louie over on the forums. Um, I don't know. I'm not good with, with modern day teen actors um, and young people actors, <laughs> so a lot of this is kind of mysterious to me. Uh, but we have Dominique Tipper uh, from Vampire Academy is going to play Naomi uh, Nagata, who's a native of the belt and the brilliant chief engineer of the Canterbury. Uh, Kaz Anvar from Olympus is a retired Martian Navy pilot Alex Kamal. Uh, Wes Chatham is from The Hunger Games, Mockingjay. He's going to be playing Amos, an Earthborn engineer running from a dark past. Jonathan Banks from Community and Breaking Bad. I feel like I probably know what this guy looks like. You know like him. He's Mike. He's both of those shows. Okay. Mike oh, from Breaking Mike. Bad. Oh, he's Mike? Yep. I love Mike. Ah. Oh. But, uh, but do you know remember what happens to the XO of the Canterbury? Does he get the... Well, I, I mean, he it. is not a character throughout the series. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. And that's Jonathan Banks. He plays characters that come and go. <laughs> but he's not even, they don't even give him a name in this listing for his character. No, I know. And, and he's just like, like, oh, this guy's famous. We don't know what character he's playing. This I is know. the description. Uh, anyway, Paulo Costanzo uh, from Royal Pains is going to be playing medical technician Shed Garvey. And Jay Hernandez from Nashville and Gang Related portrays Miller's new partner, Havelock, an itinerant earth cop. Yeah, so it's interesting how they would describe these folks as officers on the Canterbury uh, because true spoiler alert here for a second. You might just close your uh -oh. ears or whatever. The Rosinante is Holden's ship with several of these people as its crew. So the Canterbury is the ship you get to meet in the very beginning of Leviathan Wakes. But it's not its not the ship that Holden crews throughout the entire series. So what do you think that is significant of, if anything? Do you think that's maybe the first? Um, I, well, yeah, obviously they're going to have to start with the Canterbury. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's maybe a, uh, them trying to avoid being spoilery. By saying, well, this is where you're going to meet them in the first episode. Or it could just be people who don't know the series and they're like, well, in that first episode, he plays this. So there we go. That's what he's playing, you know? Fair enough. Yeah, I guess if that's what they are in the first episode, that kind of makes sense. Yeah. But yeah, I'm excited about this, though. I think that's going to be really fun. Oh, I'm and so excited. Yes. What was I even more excited about? Um, oh, well, I was excited because I saw Interstellar this weekend. And there was a an unexpected casting in one of the characters that I didn't know about. And when I saw him, I don't, I don't want to spoil things because I don't know how many people have seen it's the movie. It's actually listed, and I had forgotten that I had seen it listed until okay. this okay. actor showed up. So okay. it's not a true spoiler, but I, I'm with you if you don't okay, know. Okay, I'll, I'll withhold it. There's a famous yeah, just, actor that crops up towards the end, and his character... Oh, this is hard to explain. His character is very similar to a character he's going to be portraying. <laughs> I know you always get double story. Yes. Of another book series that we read. Brian Brushwood had the same exact reaction. Did he? Well, yeah. Yeah, it's Where he's possible. like, oh my gosh, this gives me such hope for this other thing that this th person is going to be doing. <laughs> This is the worst you know what we mean. secret keeping thing of all time. Um, it's Matt Damon. <laughs> <laughs> Just blow it. After all that hard work. After all that, that's, oh, whatever. Let's, let's move on to picks. All right. Uh, we are highlighting picks from supporters of our Kickstarter. Uh, so look for threads to be posted in the Goodreads group. We'll collect your thoughts and comments on the books and then toss them around on each show until we've covered all six. We're about halfway through. These aren't official book club picks or anything, but I know some of you have been reading them and that was the idea is to expose people to even more books. So we'd love to hear from folks who've already read these. Uh, the book this time was... The Lathe, the Lathe of, Heaven. of Heaven, yes, by Ursula K. Le Guin. Um, and I have wanted to read this forever, and I'm, I'm really bummed that I haven't did, didn't have a chip on this one, but it's on my to-read list, like, whoa. Um, 
but Carrie picked it and she wrote, um, I haven't read it in a while, but it has always stuck with me and was recently released for the Kindle, so now might be a good time to mention it. Um, a lot of you guys have read this book. Um, some people said that it was it feels a bit dated. Uh, ben said, it has dated a bit more than other of Le Guin's, but still well worth a reread, and it's not that long. The Dispossessed is my favorite of hers, but it's not the best starting point for her science fiction. The Left Hand of Darkness would be my recommendation for that. Um, Tom Ahome says that there was a uh, good adaptation a few years ago with Bruce Davison on PBS, um, and that it's probably on YouTube. And Joanna says that she just finished it today. Um, did anyone pick up the extremely Taoist themes and metaphors in there also? Um, to be fair, all I know about Taoism I learned from the Tao of Pooh, uh, so I'd appreciate info from anybody who has actually studied Taoism. Yeah, I would like to to uh, find out more about that too, and it makes me want to read it because uh, I have an interest in in Taoist history and Taoist philosophy. Uh, so that's cool. Good good book discussion this time, you guys. Thanks for for digging in and, and posting. Yeah, it probably makes it a little easier when it's a pretty you know well known author. Of course, I mean more people have have grabbed it just you know organically throughout the years. Sure, sure, no, that's true. Um, next time it's the fifth of six, so we're getting near the end. Uh, we'll discuss the Secret Route by D. S. Carr, which was suggested by Ira. So post your thoughts to the thread at Goodreads.com, and we'll discuss more about them next time. Absolutely. And of course, there's more upcoming releases at swordandlaser.com slash calendar. All right. Well, now it is time for Barrier Sword, which is our feedback from the audience. And there was a lot of really great, like, book suggestion threads this month that I picked up on. I think a lot of you are kind of focused on the discussion of do androids dream of electric sheep and maybe weren't thinking too much about other stuff, um, like other discussion topics. So there were a few great, like, suggest new things for me to read threads. And this one was from John. He said, what hard science fiction do you like? He says, I'm currently rereading Paul Anderson's uh, Tau Zero. Uh, Tau. It's T-A-O, not T-A. I mean, it's T-A-U, not T-A-O. You still say Tau. It's still Tau? Okay. Not Tau. Not Tau. Uh, Tau Zero. It's a tale of people stuck on a Broussard ramjet that can't stop accelerating. Great use of science here, and the science is integral to the story. I'm also a fan of Niven's work for the same reason. Good use of known scientific principles, but there's not so much hard sci-fi these days, so I'm curious. What hard SF books have people in this group read that you like? Um, and, you know, we've read, we, we, I feel like we've read a fair amount. Um, uh, Paolo and Lindsay uh, both recommended Blind Sight, um, which is one that we read. <laughs> which we way had back a when. very deep discussion about whether it was hard sci fi or not when we read yeah, it, actually. By Peter Watts. Um, and it's, uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, I enjoyed it, but we did. I think it was one of, the, one of those books that people kind of went one way or the other on. And I think that discussion of hard science fiction definitely came into some of that. Um, Phil recommended author-wise David Brin, Robert J. Sawyer, Kim Stanley Robinson, and Peter F. Hamilton. Um, he left out all of their middle name initials, so I put them all back in. <laughs> Very nice of you to do that. Because that's how I know how to say their names. Right. Um, any other good ones in here that you've picked up? Oh, we have, uh, of course, um, Andy Weir, The Martian. Yeah. The aforementioned, not forementioned Martian <laughs> from earlier in this episode. I thought it was interesting. Emma pointed out 2001: A Space Odyssey. I think it's so popular, people forget it's hard sci-fi. Uh, it you know it may not be the hardest, but it mm -hmm. is definitely hard sci-fi. Uh, the Tale of Atlantis, which I'm not, I have not read, and Dune. Now Dune gets a little trippy with its spice, so it, you can mm -hmm. make an argument it's not hard sci-fi because of that. But the science port part, if you leave out the melange, uh, is actually pretty pretty good hard sci-fi in a lot of places so it's, a, it's an interesting suggestion to throw out there and of course Carl, Carl somebody was going to throw out The Moat in God's Eye by Niven and Pornell and that's a great one uh, Carl points out the curious thing is the book is from 1974 the world population hit 4 billion that, that year now it is 7 billion and we're talking about peak oil and global warming so it's obvious we are the Modis well it would have been silly speculation back then so it's pretty prescient Mm, interesting. Yeah, we had suggestions for Alistair Reynolds and uh, Ian M. Banks. So, I mean, there's tons of great authors that we could we could talk about hard sci-fi authors all day, probably. Now, this is the sword and laser, not the sword and laser and wounds they cause, which I, I was trying to come up with, like, if we added horror, what would it be? Sword, uh, laser, and gore? 
<laughs> sword, sword, laser. sword, laser, and adrenaline. Uh, but there's a really good thread that was started by Drew about uh, looking for psychological horror recommendations. Drew saw a recommendation for We Have Always Lived in the Castle by Shirley oh, Jackson. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It was, uh, you're reading that from top down. Uh, it was reversed on the, on the forum threads. It's actually started by Jason. Oh, um, why is my thread seeing, upside down? I think it's the link I pasted in there. I was doing some things by newest rather than first. Weird. Um, so if you see something with Oh, so Jason bottom, says, Jason I know psychological said, yeah. horror is neither sword nor laser, but I want to mix it up a bit and read something different. Uh, and so we got some good at recommendations. Uh, we have always lived in the castle by Shirley Jackson, the devil in silver. Uh, Casey says, doesn't blow your socks off, but it isn't bad. And shutter Island is one that Casey hasn't read, but heard positive things. And of course the film was, uh, was very well received. Although Casey says it's best ignored. So it wasn't well received by Casey. <laughs> um, American psycho listed though. I, uh, though people have said, uh, Casey said, no, not really any sci-fi or fantasy elements. Um, but there is a big, you know, slipping into madness portion, uh, hmm. which is good. Um, and then, uh, Tom Ahome said, what about Bob? <laughs> With a very what? scary shadow in the movie poster. Not sure if that was a book per se. Not sure if that was an adaptation. No. Nope. No. No. Yeah. I'm scared no. of things, so I don't read a lot of scary stuff. Uh, Stephen King's The Shining is Anja recommended. I think a lot of Stephen King could probably fit into that subgenre. It's definitely psychological being... horror. The Shining, in, yeah. for sure. Classic. While still having some of those metaphysical, you know, fantastical elements to them as well. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. I read a profile about Stephen King and Rolling Stone recently, and um, he kind of said the same thing that Patrick Rothfuss said about genre fiction. And how a lot of people say that genre fiction isn't doesn't stand up to literary fiction or um, you know serious fiction or you know real critical thinking fiction, mm -hmm. and they both were kind of like, well, you know, you can't judge a genre by its lowest common denominator. You can't you can't pretend that all genres are totally elevated and that there isn't slop in each kind of genre. Um, but there's also really good writing in all kinds of genre. And you, you, I, I've been seeing that echoed a lot recently because I think people are starting to take genre fiction more seriously as a as a serious. That was redundant. You know well, what I mean? It's, it's yeah, taken more it's seriously. It's an eternal argument. Circles. I mean, I, when I worked in the bookstore uh, back in the '90s, there was always a big debate amongst us as well as the customers where certain books should go. We had a literature section. And we had a sci-fi mystery romance, et cetera, et cetera. And people like Kurt Vonnegut were like, well, he writes sci-fi. Sorry. You know, like he should go in both. But people, oh, no, but Kurt Vonnegut is literature. It's like, well, why? Right. You why? know, I mean, yes, he is literature. I'm not denying that. Certainly not every science fiction author is literature. Not every romance author. Not every horror author. Not every mystery author. But, you know, does every story have to be about you know, mainstream life in the time in which you're writing. I mean, if you're writing old, you're writing historical fiction. That's genre fiction. I mean, genres just break up types of stories. That's all. Yeah, I totally agree. So don't don't judge a book or a genre by its cover. Or its say. genre section or the or sign above it. Don't, don't judge it by its name or previous. Just don't ever judge it. Don't judge read it. Don't judge then, things, you guys. You it's not judge. nice. Yeah. Just don't do that. Don't get judgy. Hey, so let's talk about local meetups. Um, you guys have been posting over on Goodreads about all the different local groups that you've created around Sword and Laser, getting to meet each other in person, having a drink of uh, coffee or a beer together, chatting about the book of the month or whatever else you feel like talking about. And uh, so I want to highlight a few of those. A la Vaginal Fantasy, we do that on that show as well. Uh, Terp Kristen uh, really wanted me to let you guys know through Twitter and other forms of contact. <laughs> Very important, Terp Chris wanted me to know that the MDDC Nova group is looking for more members. They're trying to get people together in that area, and um, they're trying to get a group to meet in person, and they've been having a hard time getting people. So if you're living in those areas, if you're... You if you're in the D.C. area, If you're in the D.C. area, I don't know. Is that North Virginia? Is it's North Maryland, Virginia? District of Columbia, Northern Virginia. Okay, thank you. I, I used to live there. I used to live in Arlington, so that's the Very only reason cool. I know that. So if you're in that area, um, yeah, definitely get together. I think there's a lot of people probably over there who would and love Rob, to meet you. Rob, who lives closer to Baltimore than D.C., still is willing to do the D.C. meetup. So Ooh. he's he's your example. There you go. You guys got a lot to live up to. 
Uh, there's also an Orange County meetup uh, that one day I will make it to down the 405 <laughs> and then the 605 and then the 710 and then the 91 West and then the 5 and then I'll be there. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think it's even closer to that. Anyway, October 27th is when the next one was no. planned. So no, I don't know. It is written in the thing I wrote out for you. November 24th. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong PM. thing. Oh, oh no. November 24th. Where does it say that? <laughs> November 24th, 6.30 p.m. Red. at the Barnes and Noble Booksellers. How did you know that? Because I, it's look at look at where it's highlighted in the doc. I know, I see it in the doc now. But oh, it's a, you had to page through to the next page on the on the Goodreads. So there we go. Sorry about that. November twenty fourth, six thirty p.m. If you're in and around Orange County, California. Unless they were looking to time travel back to October, <laughs> pre Halloween, to get together, that would make an interesting group meetup. That now you have to pick. Happening. If you're in California, you can either go to the Orange County one or the San Francisco one. Yes, you have options. You have options. Josh and I will be at the San Francisco Sword and Laser Meetup over at Borderlands Cafe, uh, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., November 24th. So that is the week of Thanksgiving. So some of you might be out of town, um, but maybe some of you will be off work and able to attend. Um, we've been uh, having a great time at the meetups there uh, and then going out for a drink afterwards at the Phoenix across the street to continue our discussion or just talk about life and fun and other stuff we're into. The so universe. we Love to have you. Everything. Life, the universe, and everything. Uh, yeah, so November 24th, 6 p.m., Borderlands Books Cafe. Uh, we're in the back of the room, so come hang out, and maybe we'll bring some tabletop games next time, too. That would be fun. Fancy. All right, let's kick off our book of the month discussion. Like I said, we're not going to be terribly spoilery because I know a lot of people are still reading it. So if you haven't finished it, you can safely listen to this discussion unless you're one of those lockdown people who wants absolutely no information about the book whatsoever, then you might want to stop. Uh, but let's start off with uh, a, a thread from Bookshelf. Oh, okay, yes. Um, so there was one important thing that was missing from the book and the movie, and that's coffee. They got the cigarettes, but no coffee. There should be at least one Nighthawks at the diner kind of scene. Um, so this is, of course, a, a pretty common uh, film noir trope, right, to have coffee and cigarettes. Right, right, cigarette and, and coffee. Yeah. Sitting at the diner. Sitting at the diner talking about... Why did this about, dame pick me? Mm. Of all the coffee shops in the world, she had to pick this expensive single-origin brew shop. I don't think they said that. Not in the old well, 40s noir that I'm thinking about. No. Um, mm. Yeah, so Kenneth kind of hit on it. He says coffee is a plant. I suppose they could have synthetic coffee, but given the environmental context, I'd say if you aren't off-world, you're not getting any coffee. And I don't remember, and I haven't finished the reread yet, actually. I don't remember if he specifically addresses it. And many Philip K. Dick books do address the absence of coffee. Uh, and Philip K. Dick isn't alone. There's a lot of sci-fi writers who make that part of a sort of declining civilization scenario is one of the first things to go is coffee. Like, oh, do you remember real coffee? You can't get real coffee anymore. And so I think that's just sort of assumed in here is like, yeah, they're, they're never going to have coffee because coffee died a long time ago. They barely have any animals left, for goodness sake. They're certainly not going to have coffee. Yeah, they were pretty stoked on having wine. Wine and, yeah. and, you know, scotch and anything left over from the previous era where that stuff was bountiful and, you know, things made of living plants. You know, well, you, need, you need grapes, you need you need wheat, you need whatever else, mash, whatever else makes your, your beverage of choice. Um, but those things also survive well um, if they're kept in the proper conditions, you know. Booze, booze will persevere through time if it's, if it's able to. Coffee actually has a problem now in reality. Like there are only a few varieties that are cultivated. There's pl plenty of varieties that exist in nature, but only a few are cultivated and there are diseases threatening current coffee plants. Uh, yeah, there's that has diseases, there's uh, uh, parasitic diseases, um, there's like root rot, there's all sorts of stuff. Um, so I don't know if you guys know this, but I'm actually a big coffee nerd, and uh, we've we've traveled to all sorts of places. Coffee and chocolate are like our two favorite things, and so we go to we've my husband and I have visited like coffee plantations and 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 chocolate plantations, and they're very similar in a lot of ways, um, the way they're you know harvested and grown, but they suffer from a lot of the same kind of maladies too, and they can only be grown in certain areas. Like it has to be. A certain kind of humidity, a certain kind of temperature, a certain kind of 
soy and all this stuff. It all is very important. So you would think that coffee and chocolate probably too would be some of the first. They're very sensitive plants. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it is interesting that he chose not to explain it in this book, although in other books he mm -hmm. definitely highlighted it. But I think that's why it's not there. You got a dystopia. Yeah. And it definitely is a dystopia if there's no coffee. Oh, I was not a world I want to live in. No, absolutely no, not. thank you. You would be emigrating to the home worlds right away, I'm sure. I'd be out. I'd be like, drop the mic. I'm out. Peace. Uh, and so this was a great thread because Jay just kicked it off with a question. And I think that's really cool. Uh, he said, why can't empathy be programmed? To which Dwayne responded, I feel you. Get it? Well, well played, Wayne. Get it? Dwayne, 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 I feel ya. That was funny. Um, yeah, why can't empathy be programmed? That is an interesting question. Um, we have some other responses from uh, Bookshelf, for example, who said, I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. Quite honestly, I wouldn't worry myself about that. What? Is that a joke from the book? It seems like it. It seems like it's a joke I'm not getting. Well, and here's the thing. A lot of people are saying, given the current state of things, uh, it's un unfathomable. We, of course, we could have computers that could detect empathy. So why wouldn't these super advanced androids uh, detect it? And I liked what Rob Secundus said. Uh, I think there's an intentional incongruity going on here. I'm only a third of the way through, but there's some really weird stuff going on with empathy and emotions in general. First of all, from the very first scene, it seems like the human brain is programmable with empathy. Deckard's box is capable of making him and his wife feel everything from despair to genuine empathy towards each other or to cut off all the empathy they feel. Then we get through Isidore, an introduction to the Mercer empathy box, whose entire point seems to be imparting empathy. And then we actually see the Voigt test of all the empathic responses that have to do with animals, and more specifically, how a human being living in a society of Mercerists would react to questions about animals. Remember, animals are very scarce. Deckard buys the explanation that Robo Woman is from a spaceship without having grown up in Earth culture or around animals. This is to say that it seems like in this novel, the humans who act like programmable robots and they misunderstand something basic about the androids they produce, it's not that they don't feel empathy. Robo Woman is not at all a fan of using the skin of humans, for <laughs> instance. It's that the empathy they feel is different from and expressed differently from the weird, twisted things that the remaining humans on Earth feel. Mm -hmm. But because they're human, the human beings just assume this means they can't actually feel empathy. And that's definitely a theme throughout Philip K. Dick's works is what is reality and what separates us you know, how do we know what is really human and what isn't? And he's playing with that in this book for sure. Yeah, um, it does. It does kind of show the the logic holes in in creating a test like that. Um, that's you know basically the whole. Are you okay? <laughs> it's 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 kind of the basis, one of the primary plot points of the book. Because as some of the commenters on this thread uh, mentioned, Resh, for example, a human um, doesn't doesn't do so hot, or or is he a human? Sorry, uh, well, it, it, it right. was to say at this point in the all book, bets are off on all um, characters at any point, right? Pretty much, um, but it's very difficult to tell because he does not seem to display the same amount of empathy um, that other humans who have taken the test do, while some of the androids do quite well on the test overall. Um, so it's it, it seems to be a very flawed uh, process by which you decide who is who is human and who is not human. Um, the Mercer stuff was was super interesting because it's almost like a reminder that we need to have empathy and like a a, a primer, a a, a refresh, um, remembering what it is to be human and why that's important. And of course, everyone's vegetarian on the New Earth, and I thought that was that didn't really hit me until they kind of mentioned it later in the book. It's like, oh well, if animals are so important to basically prove that you're human, um, you you're not going to eat them, like, right? Goes against if, if everything. You, if you took thirty thousand dollars for an ostrich, or whatever it is, like you're definitely not killing that thing and eating it. Ever. Yeah. And you know, it kind of makes me question myself because I am a, I'm a, and I'm. You don't I, have to pay that much for an ostrich. I don't have to pay that much for an ostrich. Essential to your decision making. But let's go off on a little tangent for a second because All right. I am a former vegetarian. Me too. Uh, yeah, my husband is a pescatarian. He does not eat things that... Mine is not. Okay. But I... 
my own empathy sometimes because I love animals. Like I have animals as pets. They are my heart and soul. Like I love them like I would children. I can't make that claim because I don't have children, but I assume you guys were like, yo, you don't know true love until you have a child. But basically all my heart knows at this point is the love that I have for my family and my animals. But at the same time, I eat meat. So what does that mean? Does it just mean I don't think about it enough? Is well, I'm a bad person. Are we all bad people? What's the deal? It's a whole. It's a whole other. Uh, it's a whole other conversation, right? Right. I mean, you can do an entire series of podcasts on that, and people do. I think, in the context of this book, it actually becomes very simple. Which is, when animals are scarce, you're not going to eat them because mm -hmm. there's just not a lot around. When animals are no longer scarce, then it becomes a question of what is the ethics of food, right? We eat plants because we assume plants don't feel, that they, they don't suffer, but plants are alive. So you're killing to eat plants. That sounds silly to, you know, kill a vegetable, but you know, what if, there have been some studies that show that plants have limited amounts of communication and this and that, what, but what if we found out tomorrow that, that plants are much more aware than we thought? It's mm. likely, it's a science fiction story, but what if we did, would we stop eating plants? Um, there's, then there's eating things like us, like dogs, uh, like mammals where you're like, ah, that's getting close to cannibalism, right? And cannibalism is tab taboo for yeah. most societies. So that makes sense. Like, okay, well, of course I'm not going to eat a mammal. So it, it you know, it, it comes down to like, Hey, remember pigs are mammals. All right. Okay. Uh, remember cows are mammals, uh, and they aren't that far off. And how comfortable do you feel eating? I, I feel it's, it's, it's hard. Like I'm never going to judge someone who feels it is morally wrong to eat an animal. At the no. same time, no. I don't think that our species is meant not to eat them. We, we evolved as omnivores, not, we should, we should be eating plants and we should be eating meat. But people um, will say that we have evolved past that. Yeah, no. And that, and that's a fair argument to have. And that's why I say you can have an entire series about this because you can very carefully and rightly make a good argument that, uh, that animals shouldn't be. It's, it's difficult. It's something I definitely wrestle with, but apparently yeah. I don't wrestle with it enough to stop eating cheeseburgers. <laughs> then the smell of bacon funny. comes wafting, wafting through. In. Do you ever notice that bacon never just like the smell never just shows up. It, it's always described as wafting. Yeah. Well, it really is like kind of the definition of a wafting smell, right? Yeah. I was running Sunday morning and it was kind of amazing because I swear a dozen different houses were cooking bacon right at the point that I was running. And so, and some of them even like you could smell coffee. So I would run pat, run through these clouds of bacon and coffee smell. It was awesome. This is a, I play tennis and uh, a roof of a building. And uh, sometimes that there is breakfast cooking in the building in the kitchens. And I get, we get hit with bacon smell on the roof and it's very, I'll it's tell you what, trying times, trying times you, at the tennis club. If I wanted to put an end cap on this discussion, if technology gets to the point where you can reliably uh, replicate the taste and texture and nutritional content of all types of food, uh, then yeah, there is no reason to to kill animals other than for environmental reasons. There, there are environmental reasons to have hunts. Uh, and and you, we can argue about that. That's a whole different situation. Um, but yeah, you know, like keeping population under control because of of predators and stuff is is a very natural function of all species, including us. And maybe yeah. there's a better way to come up with that. Maybe there's another species that can take over that natural. There is a fantastic, uh, I believe it's either this American Life episode or Radio Lab episode about the goats down in. I think they're down in the Galapagos. Um, in the Galapagos Islands, goats were brought over. I'm not sure if it was, I don't remember if it was accidentally or if they were brought over some for some kind of like plant control. And then they got out of hand. And they got something. out of hand. And now there's just hundreds of goats on the yeah. Galapagos Islands and they're pushing out other animals. And so they've been trying to do all these crazy scientific things to humanely like cull the population. And um, one way is that they have tracker goats. So they basically catch a goat, and because they're herding animals, they'll put a little tracker on it. 
and they can never find the, the they can't keep track of the population sometimes because they hide places or hard to find. So the tracker goat like is released back onto the islands and then it finds the rest of its family and it basically leads the hunters to their family. Oh my god, total Judas goat. Yeah, that's exactly that, what that that's is. That's what they called it. That's what they called it. Tom. Yeah. That was perfect. Thank you. Yeah, it was the Judas goat. And so they would it would bring them back to the people and the people would follow the goat. <laughs> And then they'd eat the goats because they're delicious. Well, yeah, some people think so. Goat yes. cheese for sure. Ah, oh, shiver. Um, all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that about wraps it up for this episode of Sword and Laser. Um, thank you guys for listening. Uh, we're going to try to be better about posting about when the live episodes are happening so you can watch the episode as it's unraveling online, um, literally unraveling sometimes as we devolve into conversations about human eating habits and, and Judas goats. But, you know, as we do. Um, so I'm going to start making a Google Hangout event pages and sharing them up on the Twitter, putting them in the forum so you guys can RSVP and, and maybe add it to your calendar and come Very watch cool. with us. Um, send us questions over Twitter as it's happening live. The Q&A app seems to be broken. Uh, no one can figure out how to use it for some reason. Hmm. Um, we didn't get any questions and Ralph said it was broken. So I don't know why. I'm looking at it on the page, but there's no questions. I did my best, I swear. We'll look into it. We will look into it. Um, if you want to support our show, if you enjoy what we're doing over here on Sword and Laser, head over to patreon.com slash, uh, slash sword and laser. Sorry, patreon.com slash sword and laser. Um, we're planning some fun stuff for patrons of the show, and uh, we really appreciate all the support you guys have given us uh, now and throughout the years. You've been an awesome audience. Uh, if you want to get. The jingle is in progress, we should say. We <laughs> got an email from Paul and Storm earlier this week. Things are happening. We'll keep. Well, you, you just there. blew it to the non-Patreon members because only the patrons knew that it was Paul and Storm. But now everybody they had, knows. They had they had early knowledge of it, though. I think it's fair to say that now. Okay. And well, if you want to be a patron now, you can get a jingle sung by me and Tom, as written and performed by Paul and Storm. Um, we are going to send that out to patrons of Sword and Laser. Um, so that's the only way you're going to get it, unless you steal it from someone else who's a patron. Please don't do that. Nobody wants that. It's not very nice. Uh, but we're excited about that one. Not excited about singing, but excited about everything else. Oh, Mark Martinez says, why is the Q&A app broken? Guess not. In the Q&A app? Yes. Oh, well, it's not. So there. I guess Ralph just doesn't know how to use the Q&A app. Oh, maybe Ralph is broken. <laughs> Aha. The Ralph is broken. The Ralph is broken. Thank you, Mark. Um, for proving that it is, in fact, working. All right, if you want to get in touch with us, the address is feedback at swordandlaser.com. Our website is swordandlaser.com. All of our discussions happen over at goodreads.com slash swordandlaser. And if you want to call and leave us a voicemail, the phone number is 415-7-SWORD-6. We'll see you guys next time. Bye, everybody. Bye.